I'm really excited to have this conversation with Dr. Val Brown, who, as many of you probably already know, is the co-creator and really the mastermind behind the technology of the neurooptimal system. And he and I have had conversations over the years about the intersection between meditation and neurooptimal and the kinds of states that people find them in themselves in when they do the neurooptimal sessions um, that we always thought, well, we should, we should do this conversation um, as a webinar to, you know, help people understand not only how neurooptimal works, but also what is that intersection between regulating the brain and the results you can see from neurooptimal with your meditation practice. And I should just kind of add before I uh, ask you, Val, to share a little bit about your relationship with meditation, to just say that I'm a, a meditator of 30 years in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and uh, teach in that tradition. And so, you know, it's a it's a lifelong passion of mine, just looking at the relationship between the brain and mental health and the spiritual path and the path of meditation. So I'm really excited we can have this conversation. And uh, for those of you who are joining us live, you know, we'll have an opportunity for questions um, and you can just put them in the chat window. That's probably the best place. And then um, we'll address them um, either as they fit in or maybe at the end. So with that intro of myself in the context of this conversation, Val, I would love for you to share just a little bit about, um, you know, we've had other conversations where you've talked about your history in terms of your training in psychology and neuropsychology in the brain. And maybe this time, just if you can focus a little bit on just what your interest and, and path has been with meditation, um, I think that'd be a great starting place. Sure, sure. Um, it, it is kind of funny to think back over things because, um, <laughs> you know, as I think about sort of the, the path that I've I've traveled the paths and all the various people that I've met. Um, I would say that I've probably I just turned sixty nine, and earlier this year, this summer, and as I think about it, it's probably been sixty five of those years when I've been actively meditating and or doing other related kinds of practices. Um, I started some backyard martial arts training uh, because of a friend of mine whose father was actually a Chinese martial artist. And uh, he taught us how to walk like a tiger and jump like a praying mantis and how to play what he called soap bubbles which later I realized uh, when I saw an older gentleman in a park by himself doing that, I walked up to him and, and you know, he showed me, he said, you know, what, what is this? What does this mean? And he said, oh, it's Tai Chi Chen. And it's like, oh, really? Because when I was going to no longer see that friend, really, because they moved and, you know, blah, blah, blah. The father had said, "I never forget how to chase soap bubbles, or walk like tigers, or jump like praying mantises. You know, someday you'll find a use for it." And so it's, it, it, you know, it's funny to say, but all of this has really been a lifelong passion and mission and commitment for me. So. So the, the, <laughs> the seeds of mindfulness were planted early in your childhood. Yes, yes, that, that that's certainly a good way to put it. Yes, <laughs> whether whether anything else has come forth from that, who knows? That's not right. my place to judge. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's also been funny because I've had a very odd relationship to more formalized practice. And I think that's part of what's fun for me 
among many other things, of, of you and I talking uh, at times, because I know you're very connected into the Tibetan uh, Buddhist community. And that's that's really wonderful. It absolutely is. I'm much more like the wandering Taoist or the you know, the barbarian from the south, uh, sort of stuff in the history, where um, I haven't really had like a dedicated home, if I can put it that way. Um, instead, I sort of float in and out of places, and um, that always makes it it's a very different perspective, I think. But there we are. And so when you were getting interested in mental health and in the brain and the connection between mm -hmm. the brain and mental health, what did you, if anything, kind of uncover about how the brain functions and particularly what the brain is like and, and experience is like when the brain is functioning at its best that kind of you understand as kind of intersecting with the qualities of, of what people are trying to accomplish in meditation practice. Or maybe a, a more simple way of putting is, when did you have those kind of aha moments um, when you were studying kind of healthy brain functioning that made you go, oh, this is interesting. This reminds me of martial arts or the mindfulness mm -hmm. kind of practices uh, that mm -hmm. I've been connected with. Well, the, the thing that stood out for me um, sort of all along, it, it formalized for me or crystallized would be a better term uh over time but i'd always been intrigued by how many many people seemed to cement themselves into certain habits or practices or beliefs or thought patterns and how challenging that seemed for them to change and it was kind of like the change is the basis of everything there's nothing that doesn't change. So why would you presume that stasis, that staying the same in any fashion, is something preferred? That just doesn't make sense. Nothing stays the same. And so in that sense, <clears throat> I sort of developed uh, almost an aversion, if you will. That's a little too strong particularly in a Buddhist context, but it was almost an aversion to anything that talked about state. Because it's kind of like there aren't discrete states. We're always we're always transitioning. It's always bardo is another way to think about it. If I can borrow that term. There's there is nothing that is is static. So even when we talk about meditating, if you if you carefully look at what's happening, you're always sort of shifting in and around the different practices or styles highlight different learnable skills to help you release those attractions or those seductions or those um, attachments, if you will, where, you know, oh, that's a thought. Or, oh, that's a judgment, you know, when you do that kind of thing, or the explicit stopping practice, or chanting, and just becoming the chant, allowing the chant, or you're doing dedicated uh, koan, koan practice, and all you are is mu, or mu, right, depends on the tradition. Or you're focusing very much on drawing seeing the mantra, seeing the mandala, seeing the mantra, seeing whatever that visualization is, right? All of those things are different ways of <laughs> helping you release the ways that you get away from just simply being in the present. I mean, it was as Thich Nhat Hanh talked about it, and I'm glossing that, of course, is half tea. If you really have tea, that's it. Whatever you do, 
you know, sit or stand, just don't wobble. I mean, and that's interesting and because I think most people, um, when at least in in kind of the larger culture, American culture, Western culture, mm -hmm. now meditation practice is more about helping to create a state of calm or a state Correct. of focus, you know, mm -hmm. and for example, like, um, you know, the, the muse headband, which sure. um, is used, you know, is marketed as like a meditation aid, right? I'm just right. bringing this up in part because you're saying that you started to notice you know, that state or the rigidity of wanting state or the brain being in rigid states, right? So we know that anxiety, mm -hmm. major depression, right? Those are rigid patterns, mm -hmm. right? And produce mm -hmm. this symptom mm -hmm. that we call depression. Right. So it's interesting right. to think about, and maybe we could talk a little bit about, understandably, people don't want to be in that fight, flight, freeze energy. Of right? course, right. They don't right. want to be mm -hmm. stuck there. And so conversely, they think, oh, well, I want a state of calm. I want to be calm instead of, yes. Right, uh, exactly. And yeah. and have mm -hmm. an idea of something that's kind of a, kind of a pattern, um, but that's a, that's an enjoyable one or like, you know, good <laughs> feeling or a state right. of calm or a state of focus. So, you know, it, I'm bringing it up now because it's a really interesting um, difference. First of all, between thinking about meditation as a mental health tool, which I think sure. most people these days are coming from that point of view. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that versus mm -hmm maybe what we'll categorize as spiritual meditation, which is really about transcending, you know, the, the patterns, the larger patterns that create mm -hmm. kind of fun, more fundamental confusion or more fundamental suffering. We could say just to keep it vague for a minute. And so, <laughs> right. you know, maybe just going back to the design of neurooptimal, right. And talking yeah. about, how NeuroOptimal is designed and how you think about kind of the potential transformation that can happen for the brain using NeuroOptimal regarding this mm -hmm. kind of idea of creating a better state, right? We'll say. Yeah, and I, but I think you, you've hit on it also in terms of to even think about it as creating a better state there's a whole bunch of judgment involved in that. You know, uh, I, I used to do a presentation, which was kind of helping people detangle the concept of peak performance. Because, you know, you look at somebody like uh, Michael Jordan, and here I am dating myself by pulling him out, but, you know, wh whomever you want to choose, and you you look at the peak, it's the mountain peak, right? Well, no one can live there. You know, you can't, uh, Domino's is all around the world, but you can't get them to deliver to the peak of the mountain. It just doesn't work. You know, you can't stay there. So the idea that we're supposed to be a, a peak performer is like, wow, that's an interesting belief. Because to me, it's like, well, what's the mother of four who is divorced and has to work three jobs to keep things going? That's peak performance. It's what it really is, is optimal flow and function. It's how do you most effectively and efficiently flow with whatever comes up? As opposed to, no, I want to be calm. Well, let me do my calm thing and I'll be cool. Right. Mm -hmm. Now right, I, now I'm cool, you know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's how do you how do you do that? How do you how do you help how do you help the human psychophysiology and totality? How do you help it do that? Okay, how do you 
And to me, it's not like that's an achievement. It's what we're born with. It's intrinsic. Right, so maybe you can say more about that because I think, mm -hmm. you know, the, the brain and when people talk about, you know, frequencies and they're like, how do I get into like the alpha state? Alpha state. Right? right. You know, and to just talk, maybe talk a little bit about, about like, well, what is the expression of, you know, because we're measuring the Hertz frequencies of the brain, what, what is a healthy expression of those frequencies um, that, that NeuroOptimal is relating with versus kind of our naive ideas of like, mm -hmm. well, could you increase my, my alpha and like decrease my whatever, right? Which is, right, again, right. this sort of like understandable misunderstanding that there's something that's going to be a constant and that's better, that's healthy, Right. <laughs> I, you know, I was always intrigued to notice how Buddhist practice in particular uh, focused on breathing, right? And of course, you know, like, well, sure, that's a great place to focus. But I always thought in terms of, well, how come it's so important to really focus on that? Because there's no state. It's a flow. Right, yes. Right? You can't just like... Okay, now I've breathed all I need to. Good. I'm done. I can just stay here. No, you can't. The whole point is if you follow your breath, you know, sort of that that suggestion or that approach, right? What you're following is the flow of living. And I don't even want to say the flow of life, because that makes life a thing out there. You know, it's it's your living, it's your evolving now, it's your now. Everything beyond now is illusion, past, future, illusion. And the question is, how do you maintain what doesn't exist in a way that constrains you so badly? That's really what's going on, I would say. And, you know, it's it's... I'm saying this very succinctly, so it can be easily misunderstood, but that's what's going on when one is anxious. You're anticipating all the things that can go wrong that haven't happened yet. And you're anticipating them, not from the point of view of, oh, okay, if this happens, here's what I can do. Or, well, if that happens, then here's this other option. Well, no, I don't know how to handle this third thing. Okay, let me go ask, you know, George or Joan, who knows how to. Right? You're, it's like, oh, my God, this is what might happen. God, won't that be terrible? And I don't know what I can do. Oh, it'll be overwhelming. It'll be terrible. That takes enormous amounts of effort to do depletes enormous amounts of energetic uh, resource to do that. It's hard it's hard on the anatomy, let's put it that way, you know And yet everybody has this belief that somehow it kind of just happens to them. And so what, what's happening? Yeah, go, so go what ahead. is happening? So going going back to, what NeuroOptimal is, is attempting to encourage mm -hmm. the brain to do differently. Mm -hmm. what, what, given that, let's use that example, right, of the person sure. who's anxious, their mind is always ruminating, looking at the, mm -hmm. the future problem, reinforcing that. And so bringing in NeuroOptimal to that system, what's it attempting to do? Instead of trying to move you to a different state, okay, and, you know, muse a number of them, this is sort of the basic premise, right? If you're upset or you're whatever, unfocused, here, we'll move you to a different state. We'll entrain you, you know. Um, what it's doing is actually, by the interrupts in the music, the little discrepancies in the music, it's saying... Come back here. What's now? What's here? So all the thoughts of, 
okay, this could happen, and oh, God, it's terrible. Stop. What's here now? Yeah, but this could stop. Yeah, but it could stop. It's it's a very gentle, I say it too abruptly, mm -hmm. you know, and most of your listeners probably know, you know, it's such a small thing in the background, but it's, I always loved Thich Nhat Hanh would say, well, no, we don't talk about striking the bell. We invite the bell to sound. So the interrupts are invitations to return to the present. That's and why, all they are. And why would that's the brain it. want to do that? Right? So because that's it's all because <laughs> the present is the only thing that is. It's the only place mm -hmm. to do anything. All the rest is illusion. You know, yes, I had terrible experiences growing up and you know, I was or I had wonderful experiences or you know, whatever, right? That's all past. What matters is now. Yeah, but I learned all these things. Yes, you did. I get that. Now what are you going to do? Here you are. So what, so what I'm now? hearing is that the, the basic design of the brain's function is that it does operate in the present. Yes. But and it operates. <laughs> it has lived memories of what worked. So it could get here. Mm-hmm. And so because the primary commitment is survival, right. all the brain is doing is, okay, hey, it used to work. Let's just keep doing it. It worked well enough. You know, I used to to try to be a, a, as playful as one can about such a ca catastrophic event. is to say, you know, if you had been on Titanic and you had survived, you'd probably never forget the concept of lifeboat. But that doesn't mean you have to drag one around with you the rest of your life. It's like, okay, I get it. You were there. This is what happened. This is how you survive. Got it. And if you hadn't survived, we wouldn't be talking right now. So you survived. You're, you know, you're a trauma survivor is a much more helpful, useful, I think, appropriate way of talking instead of your trauma victim. And so if I'm understanding you, you're mm -hmm. basically saying that the brain gets habituated to mm -hmm. patterns, um, yes. you know, dragging the boat around, but that ultimately right. it does want and knows to utilize present moment information. Yeah, because it's more it's more efficient and effective. Because it's also all about maximizing the resource that's available, maximizing the use of it. You know, you what what happens in like Parkinson's and how the walking deteriorates from the outside. We look at it and we say, oh, they they, can, they have a real hard time. You know moving around well what happens is the movements become stereotypical the sensitivity of the foot moving and and feeling the contours of the environment and that changing what goes on in the various aspects of the dynamical muscle group of the ankle and the lower leg and the knee and the upper leg and the hip and the body and having all of that fluidly move, the brain can't sustain that anymore. And so it reverts to something very stereotypical, which works. The other, it is too complex. It's too nuanced. It's no longer possible to, to integrate. The brain remembers what worked, and it will do that unless... It is in the present and says, oh, I have other options. I have a different option. There's a different possibility. So you're afraid of public speaking, and suddenly you get called right then in the moment to go out, and there's a thousand people in the audience. 
and when you go out at you're at the podium and you're like you can stay in your head or you can notice for instance oh there's a glass of water here you decide i know how to drink water <laughs> and come back to the president and go hi everybody i just had a moment there <laughs> i hope you don't mind or whatever you do right mm -hmm. but it in the moment in the present is the only place you can take any action right so but the brain is programmed to survive so mm -hmm. it's going to bring up the old stuff that worked doesn't matter you didn't like it doesn't matter you didn't feel good or it's going to feel terrible now it worked you know one of the the interesting observations i've made from you know personally using the system for a long time now is that when i train and witness this in many others when they do regular neurooptimal sessions that kind of i'll call it a happy place because just to right. kind of the designation <laughs> sure. right where right. the the brain and this is you know part of the brain we don't control i'm not saying i want to get mm -hmm. to x right it's really more observing no. what shifts and yep. what i observe is that it's very similar to um the zone that we talk about in mindfulness awareness meditation practice and that is that we want to be able to have an experience of awareness of the present without getting too elated or too yes. lethargic, which is very interesting yes. because in the stress response patterning, right, we could talk about that as the hyper arousal, right, the fight flight right. energy or the hypo arousal, you know, the depressive mm -hmm. kind of pattern of the stress right. response and that the regulated kind of space in between has very similar qualities to what I would call like a good ground for being able to do mindfulness awareness meditation, which is the mm -hmm. mind is our, 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 our ability to sustain and direct our attention or our mind in a particular way, right? Which is mm -hmm. to use the example of, you know, mindfulness of breath that right. we can actually give ourselves the instruction okay keep your attention with the in breath and the out breath just the natural That's flow right. and our ability to actually sustain that practice becomes right. much easier when we're doing regular neurooptimal sessions which i find right. very interesting to see that oh so if we're assuming that neurooptimal helps that brain function better, isn't that interesting mm -hmm. that it kind of puts us in that good ground zone of actually applying our meditation technique, whatever that is? Um, yes. And I would say that another way of talking about that is that that sort of central place, if you will, because it is central in where the mind can go and where the body can go is equanimity and that's the foundation right. and once you're in that once you're there once you're within that milieu because it's not a state mm -hmm. right? it is a milieu and there are edges and there are, you know portions that feel like the fingers of aversion or the fingers of attraction are lingering out there right one of the one of the best things i found over the, the years is to if you're not totally alone in a cave someplace is to look around with compassion with everyone else there and realize that we're all more simply human than otherwise whatever you're going through i have gone through will go through i'm going through and vice versa and in that it's it's much it's easier than to settle back into the equanimity of we all interbe you know we may not like the garbage but without the garbage there can't be the rose 
So that was always, I know I'm talking a lot about Thich Nhat Hanh right now, just I don't know why, it's just what's come out. But that was always one of his metaphors to one of his images as well. You know, no mud, no lotus, you know. So it's it's the same thing. If you if you think it's about I always want to be peaceful, well no, that's not life. Equanimity is something else. Equanimity is that sort of the neutral gear, if you will, of the stick transmission, you know. I'm sure I'm sure you probably at some point drove a stick shift. I <laughs> did learned on that. You know, it's becoming a more rare phenomenon, I think, these days. <laughs> But you know you can't you can't go from forward to reverse without going through neutral, and to shift any of the gears you go through neutral, right? So th this idea of being in a neutral place, neutral just means in between conversion and attraction. It doesn't mean I don't have any of that. It, that's the other reason I. I you know, I prefer the instead of the middle way or the middle path. I think of it as the um, centering path. It's returning to the center, returning to the present. And from here is where everything happens. And all the different meditation techniques, all the different styles, whatever, are ways to, they're, they're skillful means. They're a pile. They're, they're ways of, um, helping different individuals at different times to have that taste of the equanimity, have the taste of that compassion, have the taste of, as uh, Anna Chodron would talk about it, you know, feeling into that tender heart, which when you can do that, when you let yourself do that, especially when it's incredibly painful, everything changes. And, and that's, that's very different from trying to just feel peaceful. Mm -hmm. right? Or, yes. You know. And that's another thing that I've witnessed over and over again over the years when people do neurooptimal is that there is much greater sense of sensitivity and openness. And if people like what's arising in their awareness, right, like a feeling of warmth, then they're like, yes. oh, this is great. But if what they feel or or sense is pain or fear, then they're like, oh, I don't like this machine. I don't right, right. I don't right. like so it. Yeah. yeah. It's that dance between sort of just allowing oneself to be more aware of what is versus being aware but having a strong preference and assuming that preference defines the value. And correct. And so that's what I always sort of think of as part of my role as the trainer is to help people differentiate and pull apart what your preference is, your judgment versus you're now more aware. And can that awareness, even though you don't like what you're experiencing, how is that a benefit to be more aware of your experience? And yeah, what, right. what do you want to do with that information rather than just judge it and try to like <laughs> push it down again? I know. But I but I like chocolate ice cream. Come on, I want to have that, you know. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I wanna I wanna ask you about uh, when when you brought out Neurooptimal 3.0 and one of the statements mm -hmm. that you know pieces of information was now. The, the higher frequ frequencies are being also being measured. Um, mm -hmm. And I was looking at Richie Davidson's research. For those of you who <laughs> don't know who he is, right. he's uh, um, a, a researcher who studies uh, the brain and specifically the brain of meditators and what happens right. to brain function uh, when people are meditators and specifically he did MRIs of Tibetan Buddhist monks who have spent, you know, decades meditating. And one right. of the things he noted was that there was a much more, and again, not to sort of bring it back to states, 
But just one right. of the things he noticed was the the higher gamma frequencies were much more pronounced in those um, individuals. And so I thought it was interesting that NeuroOptimal is now um, also capturing and letting the brain get feedback about those frequencies. Well, it's, it is interesting because... Um... You know, a, a lot of a lot of Richie's work has been the MRI, but then the correlate uh, voxel-based um, 256 channel EEG work, right? And trying to localize in terms of frequencies, as you kind of indicated here, but also in terms of location. And so, yes, the the higher quote gamma frequencies, higher just meaning faster. Right? Uh, though people have sort of the sense of, oh, higher is better. You know? Right. Uh, so, like, no, not really, but okay, I, I get the metaphor. Um, but the thing that always intrigued me, and, and this is not a comment about Richie or any, any other person, but at the same time that the, the, the gloss on sort of the gamma and the lateralization even of the gamma activation for those meditators was mentioned. What was not mentioned was the work that Linneman had been doing at sort of the same kind of time with the corresponding contralateral activation that was at a significantly slower frequency, um, but was still critical in the balance of this. It wasn't that there was this singular sort of focal uh, frequency region and if you just hummed at that then wow you could levitate or whatever it's a very different it, it's a comprehensive fully integrated perspective um, and I've always been much more interested in that sort of integrated comprehensive approach because that's how psychophysiology is as a whole you know that's it, and and it's it's built on negative feedback loops. So it's not about how much positive feedback can I give you to get you to a state, which doesn't really exist as a state. It's more how much can I use negative reinforcement, negative feedback, to help you come back to this centralizing place of equanimity, safety, security and maximal resourcefulness, which is the present. There, there are two different ways to get to sort of the same thing. And, you know, my my sort of sense after having it been in on this trajectory in various guises, if you will, for basically my whole life, is that those are two different approaches which can dance together very, very well. There's nothing wrong with, okay, let's do some state training right now, you know, or um, you know, let's let's do some real good compassion karuna practice, or you know, let's let's do some yoga nidra. Let's let's do you know, or go down the list of various things. Let's let's visualize, you know, the mandala. Let's let's work with the antra. Let's work with the energies let's do the chakra balance you know they're all different means that you know all different ways to climb the mountain if you will the only thing i never i didn't like about that metaphor of there are many ways to climb the mountain was it still went to like the top of the mountain is better right <laughs> right you know no it, every spot on the mountain is the same <laughs> it's right. the and it, way to think of it it implies <laughs> linearity and, yes. and I think that that's, well, there's two things I want to ask you about before we open it up for questions sure. is one sure. is to talk about just this, this um, aspect of, you know, health is a nonlinear process. And so many people think about positive things <clears throat> as moving linearly. So right. maybe just to speak about that, certainly people on the path of meditation, you know, I, I just hear this over and over again, people say, well, I stopped meditating, I can't meditate, because I can't get my thoughts to stop. 
right? And then <laughs> I, you know, I meditate and then I something happens and I forget and then I start and then they perceive that as a bad thing because again, right. the assumption is linear is the right way, is the best way. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it it is kind of that belief about um it's it's forgetting that change is the basis of everything, impermanence to use that word, right? So it means I don't care at one level, I don't care what's going on right now or how you feel about it, because it's going to change. It just is. It, it, it can't keep going. You know, there's the old jokes about, you know, oh, I know things have to, you know, are going to get really bad. Well, how do you know? Well, because they've been too good for too long. It can't, can't keep going this way, right? But it's very rare that you hear somebody say, I know something, you know, absolutely wonderful is about to happen well how come because it's been so terrible for so long it can't stay this way you know it's like okay there's an interesting asymmetry there you know um but yeah the linear the linear focus because in in the natural world the natural world functions kind of in a newtonian way in many ways that's true we can get we can get from a to b faster in various ways that's true you can walk you can ride a horse you can ride a bike you can ride a car you can take an airplane you can you know and okay so faster is better no not necessarily not if you know that the, the journey isn't about the destination it is about the journey and who you walk it with so whether it's a walk or a ride in a car or a plane who are you with and what is it like moments to moment right but that's a very different approach where you know where where we go to schools and most of the schools teach linearity one way or another you know oh i got an a i i did better uh, i i want to get a's this this time this semester instead of just b's well yeah okay that's fine but how much did you really learn is the way i would think about it because sometimes the biggest learning, you know, as, as Yoda put it, failure, the best teacher is. Right, right. right. <laughs> and and I, th I think it's important to note that a, a healthy, well-functioning brain is not functioning linearly. And no, of course not. It can't. <laughs> it absolutely can't. Try to, try to teach a child to walk linearly it ain't going to work you know it's all about experimentation and allowing them to test the edges moment to moment of their growing ability to control things as the ability to control keeps you know growing and growing and growing and the maturation goes it's it's a real thing and it's fun to do i mean it's it's if if you can enjoy it they can enjoy it too but if you had this idea of, okay, it's 12 months, they ought to be doing this right now. Not a useful way to think about it. Not a useful way to go. In my opinion, in my, from my experience. <laughs> Let's right, put it that right. way. And so I want to kind of jump to a different topic, which is um, sure. to have you, sorry, the sun keeps coming in, so I have to move my... Yes. Um, is to talk about the intensives that the the neuro optimal <laughs> community used to do, um, because I think right. there were some really interesting experiences people had, and sort of taking us <laughs> yes. from the more concrete idea of like meditation helping and neuro optimal helping the brain function better to not be in the stress response so much to be able to you know, rest yes. and digest and, and be calmer, et cetera. And thinking about it from a very sort of structural uh, health point of view to now like bridge to like interesting experiences people have that sort of transcend the, the physicality and maybe enter more into the sort of spiritual, for lack of a, sure. keeping it vague, um, because yeah. this isn't meant to be 
you know, of a particular religious persuasion, this conversation, right, right. right? But really <laughs> just to note these experiences. So can you share a little bit about, first of all, why you, what they were, and also, right. um, you know, what people experienced during these neurooptimal intensives? Yeah, well, we, we called them the immersives because the idea was to immerse in the training in a group of people uh, who were like-minded. So in that sense, you could think of it like a retreat, you know, like a session or or whatever, right? Um, and we we kind of took over a facility. Uh, it actually had originally been uh, built as a uh, drug and alcohol rehab unit, but then they became a hotel and they had like uh, executive retreats there and, you know, those kinds of things. We would sort of take it over for the whole week. People flew in from all around. And uh, back in the earliest days, um, back even before version two was out, um, we had people, um, participants, uh, doing two sessions in the morning and two sessions in the afternoon. And of course, back then, there needed to actively be a trainer for every client because, uh, you know, everybody sees the 20 target boxes on the screen now that adjust themselves and you can't even tell that they're doing that. Back then it was 16, but you had to adjust all of them manually. So that was quite the trick. And of course, that's really what Sue was, you know, just the, the best at on the planet. Um, AutoNav evolved from my uh, capturing how she did that in terms of movements and capturing it mathematically. So it would be, it would be used by anybody. So we had uh, two sessions each morning and you were a therapist in one, trainer, therapist, coach, whatever you want to call it, and a client or a trainee or a subject, whatever. And everyone was arranged with their head towards the middle, laying on the ground because that made it easier to do the hookups and have all the equipment in the center, right? Could have done it differently. But one of the things that we said, well, I don't want to get ahead of the story. What we started to find very quickly was obviously a community started to build from the people who were there. Everyone became very connected and, and committed. And so we had, I, I'd have to ask Sue to remember what the like the schedule was, but we started having them every year anyways, if not twice a year, maybe. I just don't remember now. And and people would just keep coming back. So, of course, part of what that meant was it kept getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, we, people would bring their systems so we had enough. Because, obviously, it was a lot of systems. Um, but what you started to find was that um, during in, in the gap between the first training and the second, we had people sharing their experiences, right? And then after the second session of the morning, same thing. Then you go to lunch and repeat the pattern in the afternoon, okay? And very interesting cross-group conversations started to happen where someone would say, oh, you know, I started having this dream or image or something visualizing this particular thing and somebody from across the room would go really wow i had that same image going on with me and the third person would say well so did i you know like were you the were you the trainer it's like well i was the oh geez i don't even remember do you remember was i the trainer or the client you know it started to get very interesting and at times we started noticing things like the G-Force um, visualization program would synchronize over time, which there's no, there's no mandated way that that can happen on its own. You know, you know what I mean? There's not, nothing in the program that can make that happen. So it was, it was just very fascinating to see these things starting to happen. And over time, I started to get very experimental with the group with permission. And so we started doing this thing that we called the star hookup. Because of course everybody's 
with their head to the center. And what I started to do was take one ZM and put it between two people. So you have the left channel on the left side of the head of person one, but the right channel, instead of going on the right side of person one, would go on to the right side of person two. So and there are two crossing. hemispheres was can sort of seen as one brain for the system. Actually, actually three were, if you think about it, because if you go all the way around the room, what is needed for the right channel of person number one is the right channel from the 30th person or whatever. Right. So right. All the, now, now what's fascinating about that is from a traditional, um, neuropsychological, neuropsychiatric, neuroanatomical uh, basis framework, that shouldn't even work. Or, I don't know, people should go crazy or something. I don't know, right? It worked. And, and when you say it worked, what, what was the evidence that it worked? Well, first off, nobody went crazy. <laughs> so there's a good bit of negative. Uh, but the experience of that cross-connecting that was happening uh, sort of more spontaneously or more atmospherically, if you will, was intensified quite a bit. So people having these mm. sort of spontaneous shared experiences. Correct. Correct. And it was fascinating. I mean, this went along with uh, Gary Schwartz's work at the time, uh, which was basically sidelined by the majority. And his work about, you know, we tend to think EEG is like in the head and right. we're measuring. No, actually, it's on the scalp that we measure unless you implant sensors, right? Um, but more than that, it radiates out from the body. Now, yes, the heart is a much stronger source of that kind of radiation, if you will. Radiation just means electromagnetic force or energy moving, right? Um, but this is partly why when, when people come together, particularly if they have a connection, like they're, they're lovers, they're a couple, they're married, whatever, their EEGs will synchronize as they approach each other, unless they're in a fight. It's, you know, if they're in a fight, okay, things can be different. If they're in a fight, meaning disagreement, a real mm -hmm. strong, personally, you know, affectively meaningful disagreement. But how do you know that that fight is resolved? Because the synchronization comes back, right, or starts to. So it and gets reflected on the EEG measurement. Of course it does, Yes. And as you walk by, if you're the trainer in the room and you go in the room, you walk by the EG, the system will pick that up. Now, a lot of people want to say, oh, well, that's artifact and we ought to just exclude that. It's like, no, that's not artifact. That's reality. We're, we're all, we all inter, inter B. We all inter R, however you want to say that, you know, right. and that's one of the ways in which we do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people who connect and start talking to each other even a little bit, their physiologies will start to align. The breathing, the, the posture, you know, um, if I lean in, preferentially your style may be different, but whatever it is, you might lean in as well. If I lean to the left a little bit, then you might shift a little bit to the left. Of course, there could be contrary styles as well depending on what we're talking about or what we're doing right but those kind of mirrorings happen and so the star hookup as we referred to it was something that we had a lot of fun with but of course you know you, you start talking about these things too much and people start saying okay but when would you do the star you know, I'm this kind of a person. Wouldn't the star be really good for me? And what about? And it's like, no, no, no. Just forget it. Just come on back. It's simple. It's easy. You know, you don't have to chase the. Don't chase the dragon. 
Okay, mm -hmm. let's not get into spiritual materialism. Let's not try to go down those sign roads. Right. You know, we don't want you to get addicted to the best thing because the best is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, part of um, uh, when I first learned about the immersives was um, at a, a neurooptimal conference uh, probably 10 years ago. And the trainer was telling me <laughs> that. Um, right. He, uh, one night he'd had a dream and then he went to breakfast the next morning and was sitting with a group and he was telling them his right. dream. And then someone across the table said, wait a minute, I had that dream last night. Um, I remember that. Yeah. I, and so, I know exactly who you're talking about. I know the story. <laughs> and I think it's yep. interesting for us because we do think of ourselves as being very discreet Although now, yes. you know, with with the understanding of trauma and intergenerational trauma and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we are understanding that these energetic patterns get passed down, right? We know that we can feel someone's anger when they walk in the room if they're angry. So we are cultivating better understanding that there is this interdependence and I think it's really interesting to now kind of introduce some of these experiences where people are having similar thoughts, right? Similar <laughs> images, similar narratives. Yes. They're sharing mm -hmm. them, right? So, yes. I mean, just for myself, I just love when when there are these opportunities to kind of have our, our idea of who, who we are as separate people. Who we are. Right, gets punctured a bit. Um, and yes. so if I take care of myself, right, that will that will take care of there someone we are. else <laughs> potentially. Yes, exactly. So That's yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna I'm say just... we're at the top of the hour. And for those who can stay, and I don't know, Val, if you can stay, but if oh people, yeah, I'm good. People have questions, you know, feel free to either put them in the, the chat. Or you can um, unmute yourself and, and just ask a question. Um, so, Asad, if you want to just unmute yourself and ask your question, or type it in, whatever you prefer. Hello, guys. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Hi, Val, all the way from uh, Michigan. No, I'm. I'm in. Oh, you're in. Are you in Michigan? Correct. Okay, I'm. I'm in Madrid, Spain right now actually oh, so we are spanning the globe <laughs> you know, i was a singer for many years working in tangier which is across the street from uh, oh yeah 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 okay. uh, from uh, marbella from i used to actually go to spain to get alcohol yes sure of course <laughs> yes yes she wouldn't have very much in tangier it's true that's true uh, anyways uh first i just want to thank natalie for putting this on. I think if Zengar had about four Natalies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a lot of similar names. Of, yes, exactly. It's true. You know, like Zengar uh, Nurapu would be more, uh, but we're grateful. Um, I just have a couple of things. First, uh, a quick background about myself. I've been involved with neurofeedback for many, many years, but I was always reluctant about jumping into NeuroOptimal because I was mm -hmm. I used to attend ISNR, and uh, right. which, which I think now was probably more derailing than it was informative. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so, so, anyways. Um, so now um, I, I wanted, so I've been involved with neurofeedback. I'm really grateful about what you created. I, I truly believe that you should have received the Nobel Prize for the work that you've created on NeuroOptimal. I really mean that. I own multiple businesses and I'm involved with a lot of different things in the community. And when someone is that influential in the community, you really look up to them. So when you see someone influential on a global scale, created something that's, I truly believe it's amazing. So I want to thank you. I'm really, well, really thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I had the uh, general manager of Dussault 
uh, aerospace uh, once told me the same thing he, and uh, was a very wonderful man, a very heartfelt thing. And uh, he said, you have this device that anyone can use at any time, anywhere, and it's always helpful. But that's that's unprecedented. And, you know, thank you very much. I, I really do appreciate those kind of comments. Uh, on the other hand, I, I do think, you know, in some ways, uh, we're selling water by the river, you know. Um, it's, it's all about helping the brain and the person return back to what's intrinsic and that they've, they've learned survival techniques to bury it in order to get through life and the challenges. And so it's, it's, it's really wonderful when it makes a big difference for people's lives. You just say it that way. And what what's your what's your question? My question is about extrinsic constraints. Yep. And here's here's what I've noticed. I, I don't want to take too much time because I'm sure others want to ask a question. But here's what I found about uh, there's something that very very interesting happened to me about two months ago. Um, I um, I was actually on my hundredth, hundred, hundred and plus a plus session of NeuroOptimal, and mm -hmm. my brain was doing great. Okay, I've always struggled with trying to shift the brain, though. So it was it was it was a long time of trying to shift and kept dodging, dodging ab reactions, a lot of ab reactions, and I always had mm -hmm. in the back of my mind. You know, what, what could be an extrinsic constraint? Uh, I don't do drugs. I don't do alcohol. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's not, it doesn't exist in my life anymore. I have a healthy mm -hmm. marriage. My wife is pregnant. I'm, my, I have multiple businesses. They do really well. So nothing psychologically is, is, key, is holding back. But there's this core anxiety that kept creeping up. And I said, what could it be? What could it be? Blah, blah, blah. And then by fluke, I got hair transplant. Just I, I was balding, so I went and got hair transplant. And then the doctor gave me antibiotic. He said, "Take this because you know we implanted all these hairs in your scalp, so you want to take this top strong antibiotic, so it, just you don't get an infection or something." I said, "Okay." Didn't think much about it. Came home, started taking the antibiotic, and on the third day of taking antibiotic, I I had a I went to sleep around 11 o'clock at night, and then I woke up with this severe anxiety attack. And remember, my brain was doing excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very good prior to that. And when I woke up, I was like, I was like, I really need to dig to find out what caused this brain that was doing wonderfully well after 100 plus sessions to... To, to to go south that quick those you know all those sessions how did how did they just go down the toilet so fast because it was weird so after a couple of days uh, I called the doctor and I said listen um, uh, just for a checkup and he said hey I, I wanted to ask you uh, you need to take a probiotic because that antibiotic I gave you is very strong it just destroys your gut bacteria it, it can cause you anxiety. And I said, hold mm -hmm. on, a <laughs> hold on a second. Something right. happened, yeah. you know, three days ago. So this, so now I'm asking this question: Could it be that NeuroOptimal is, is doing this wonderful, just like miraculous things to regulate, to modulate uh, brain and bring it to the present? But then this, there's this gut thing that if that's not balanced then it's going to keep pulling you in this other direction. And that could be the main extrinsic constraint, at least for somebody like me. Well, the, the challenge around the concept extrinsic constraint is um, historically people have wanted to have a, a, like a laundry list of what are the extrinsic constraints. And so... Um, you know, they'll say things like, oh, if somebody's taking benzodiazepines, you know, that's an extrinsic constraint because it blocks learning or you know, whatever, whatever it happens to be, too much coffee, too little sleep, too this, too that, whatever. Um, 
the concept of extrinsic constraint actually is very simple. It just means anything outside of the neurofeedback session itself that interferes, diminishes, or somehow dissipates the transformational impact. It doesn't mean anything beyond that. So I don't want the concept of extrinsic constraint to sound like, okay, here's the thing we've got to get rid of because it gets in the way. No, it's that for you, that's something that maybe gets in the way at this time in your life, maybe. Maybe it has for longer, maybe it hasn't, maybe it will stop. Who knows? But that it's outside of the actual session itself of the neurofeedback is what we're talking about. And so when I say things like always use regular, it's to say there's nothing more useful about extended. It's not better because it's longer. It doesn't get you there faster because it's longer. And demo doesn't get you there shorter because there's no there to get get to anyways right it's all about what's now so it's i i don't want what i'm saying right now to sound like oh oh no don't even worry about whatever's going on in your gut because it's not relevant no of course it's relevant but that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean now if other people are listening um you know like okay gosh i gotta go get my gut checked out because i probably got some problem in my gut and that's Mm -hmm. really what the problem is so that's that's kind of getting back to that linear sort of thinking of okay i'm trying to get to point x and i'm not getting there in the time frame i think i should or with the number of mm. sessions i think i should so what's in the way what can i get what can i overcome well that thinking itself is what's in the way it's it's not a particular thing per se because neuroptimal is just a mirror it's going to show you whatever is happening and it's just an invitation to the present, moment to moment. That's all. Nothing more. It doesn't change you. It doesn't mm. fix you. It really helped. I was a smoker for 15 years, and on my 40th session... <laughs> there you go. No longer wanted to. Right? I swear to God. This, yeah. this, no, I know. This is crazy. I get it. I, it's just... Yeah. I. This, yeah. this was back in April. Now we are yeah. in August. I have zero, zero desire. Zero. There Where did that 15 years of desire smoking, let's say, two packs a day or something? Where did that go? It's just what happens. It's just what happens. Well, thanks. Thanks for your question Thank and your comments. You. Said, I think I think there are probably some others here, too. Yes, I saw one absolutely. flash, Natalie. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Raluca, and sorry if I mispronounced your name, but feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hello, everyone. Yes, you pronounced it very very well. So I'm Raluca, following you from Bucharest, from Romania. Uh, ah. First, I'm uh, joining you online. So very happy Wonderful. to know you. So my question well, is welcome. around... Thank you. Um, you. You mentioned earlier about Richie Davidson's rich research on brain uh, of meditators. Yes. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. he did uh, lots of MRIs uh, on monks who were meditating for decades. And right. that he discovered that they had higher gamma frequencies than the usual people. So I was wondering mm-hmm. if if we use neurooptimal for longer time, can we can our brain benefit of I don't know better gamma frequencies eventually? Well, th- there's several things I want to say about this. Okay, first off, the premise that there is more gamma activity for certain people in certain regions. That's an artifact of how that EEG recording was done. Um, Richie ultimately developed a 256 active sensor, active channel uh, system, but it was all referenced to the same central reference. So it's going to highlight what differences there are, voxel to voxel or sensor to sensor. We do it very differently because the reality is if you don't, if you don't same reference your EEG channels, there's about 96% of the signal that is exactly the same everywhere across the scalp. So to look and say, oh, you know, the alpha is more prominent occipitally, 
that depends on how you do the actual EEG work. What's more, what's more important than where it's localized is how much access there is to it. So that's just that's sort of a background thought here. Um, in terms of, you know, will use of neurooptimal lead to the kind of experiences that the monks had, which was captured then in Richie's work? It certainly can, absolutely. But the thing I, I want to point out to everybody is the monks are human beings. They did human things. There's nothing particularly special about the compassion meditation or several of the others that were used by certain members of that, that research cohort. These are things that are central. Yes, they're, they're very well developed and very well uh, categorized and separate, separated, et cetera, and ensconced in the Tibetan lineage. And Natalie, you could talk much more about that than I can. Um, but it, there's nothing particularly special per se about them that isn't part of just being human. It's just most of us have lived lives where we have not either received the kind of instruction that would allow us to retain access to that naturalistically or redevelop it as it starts to fade away because we live in the world where we have iPads and iPhones and calculators and all kinds of devices that didn't exist uh, 200,000 years ago or 20,000, whatever number you want to choose. Um, as these traditions started to evolve out of the, the search for transforming suffering in life. And you know, the suffering that our ancestors had was a little bit different than the suffering that we have today. You know, it's not for no reason that we have road rage in the car. You know, the firmware inside of us is the same as back in the Neanderthals. And so, you know, you're dealing with the the predator who's coming after you, there's a certain fight flight uh, kind of kind of possibility there. It's just inbuilt. That's what we got. Um, but it's not helpful in, in a car, in in traffic in LA or uh, New York or whatever. Yeah, you get you can get very enraged because that was what was necessary. And the firmware takes a long time to change. It'd be really nice if we could just change that. But what practice with Neurooptimal will do, what practice with a lot of things will do, is help you have more access easily to that uh, equanimity space or region. And from there, the access to things like the compassion state or the other forms of, quote, advanced meditation experiences is much easier. It's tough to go from... Uh, overwhelmed and 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 flooding, particularly in in trauma recall, to some of those other kinds of experiences. That's that's a tough lift, no matter who you are. So I don't know if that if that helped, but it's a very good question. The short answer is, yeah, it can help. Okay, <laughs> let me just cut to that chase. Okay, thank you. And also, yeah. so. Coming back to what Neurooptimal does, right? It always brings mm -hmm. you to the present. Uh, you said earlier. It always yeah. invites you. It invites you. It okay. doesn't bring you. Yeah, it's an invitation. <laughs> Good. So it, it it invites you to the present moment. Um, yes. Meditation basically, you know, does somehow the same thing. Can we mm -hmm. uh, use Neurooptimal as a meditation tool? in some sort of <laughs> well tell me what that would mean tell me more of what you're you're asking so um i'm talking from my own experience uh when i initially sure. experienced uh neurooptimal i entered in that meditation state right mm -hmm. and i mm -hmm. felt the you know the energy flowing around me um mm -hmm. uh, lost uh, contact with um everything uh which was around me so i i i was in that flow you know 
mm-hmm. um, yes. lost the, the the time. I and so I enjoyed a lot the moment of being there, yes. um, doing that session. So I experienced right. that the first, I, I believe, ten sessions, and yes. uh, when I came back. To, uh, to do neurooptimal, I was looking after the same state, but you know, uh, life made that not happen any longer because this is life. This right. is dynamic. It's not always That's coming right. back to that. Uh, but That's right. in the ten sessions, I was there. I was like experiencing mm-hmm. experiencing the, the the meditation, even though I mm-hmm. was not meditating uh, mm-hmm. as I did in the past. It was coming back to that meditation state, and I, I just I was wondering if I could promote these to my clients, for example, to those which are in love of doing meditation as a I don't know a, a tool to to help them going in that state. I would say that the problem here is the presumption that there is a state that you're going into. And mm-hmm. the idea is yep. to get into that state. That's that's kind of a large part of what I was trying to convey in talking here. Yes, conversationally, we say that, right? It's like, oh, I'm so anxious right now, or I'm so angry right now, I'm so agitated, I'm so disappointed, whatever. I, I want to calm down, you know? And and so it, it, it makes sense to talk about, you know, different states, right? But they're, they're not they're not exclusive the way that we tend to think of them. They're flavors, they're blends, Mm -hmm. and it's flows, yes? So will clients have more access to those kinds of flows or those kinds of experiences? Highly likely, but it's not yes, no, it's not 100%, it's not linear. It's not, yeah, just turn on the switch and you get there. You know, that's... That's the fallacy. If if you come from the assumption, and assumption simply because it's a starting point, okay? Not because, oh, yes, I'm just going to assume it and make it so. No, it's a starting point for, for awareness and for your engagement with the world. The starting point is everything teaches you. Everything. Every person everything now no matter what's going on there's nothing wrong it's teaching you it's offering you a lesson the question is how do you want to respond to that often to that invitation Mm -hmm. that's really what neurotical is doing but the idea that there's a particular place i i need to get to well that's a very interesting belief you know, it's and it's a limiting belief. I'm not Indeed. sure that it's very helpful. Uh, now, you know, we part of the issue of what happens, particularly in things like here, talking the way we are, is there's always differences in language and and how we want to talk about things. And so, I might say something the way I say it, and it will sound very different in your mind. You know, yeah. So uh, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm at all being critical in what I'm offering <laughs> to you. Okay, it's 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 you know um, we we struggle with the language because it's the best thing we got. You know, um, I I used to be able to read ancient Chinese pretty well, and you know every translation of the Tao Te Ching is is a little bit limited because ancient Chinese especially, um, is so rich as a language. There are things that you can say in ancient Chinese, you just can't say in English. So trying to translate it, it's really interesting, you know? Um, And and sometimes I think that's that's a burden we all have in this kind of field. Um, Because, you know, I, I do this thing about state and I don't I want to hang on to state so much. Well, okay, fine. You know, that's my that's my thing, right? <laughs> but to other people, it's like, no, being able to be in that state of calm, man, that's really important to me because I've been so frazzled my whole life, right? <laughs> so, At the end of anyway, the day, I hope this that helps. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
it, it does help. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Okay, Claude. good. Wonderful. Thank you, Luca. Um, any other questions? I know Asad has one more question about music and certainly we'll we'll get to that. I want to see if there's anybody else who hasn't asked a question who'd like to. And if you do, just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. All right, nobody's come forth. So Asad, if you want to ask your, your last question, that'd be great. Yes, uh, thank you again, guys. Uh, Val, I have this interesting um, idea about um, singing, and the, I wanted to get your opinion on if if I could use something similar to the way NeuroOptimal works to improve my singing. And when I say singing, I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about pitch quality. So if I'm singing, mm -hmm. for example, you know, and you know, if, if my pitch quality, let's say, is 95%, that's considered really, really good. Um, right. But the truth is, to get to that very high percentage of pitch quality in your singing, you have to practice. And the biggest mm -hmm. issue with practice is you're practicing, but you, there is no feedback of telling your brain, yep, now your 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 pitch quality is very good. You're spot on. Is there a way? Right. And I'm willing to pay for for, for a programmer well, to to do this. Uh, is there a way I could well, design you, you some know, kind of software? You know what I would suggest is yes. that you get in touch with David Delaney. Okay, hold on, uh, David Delaney. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, he's he's uh, a representative, a neuro representative, and uh, he recently released a book and maybe some other materials um, that reflects his work. Um, oh, I just lost the, the word. Um, it's all about singing, but authentic singing. Do do you know Natalie? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I do, but I'm not sure what the specific languages that you're looking for. yeah yeah that's the thing it just went right out of my head um but but david david would be a really good starting point to kind of help you navigate this question um i i hear what you're saying and uh and what you're asking and um he's just been very interesting in his pursuit of his singing and the authentic voice um, I think it's a different word he uses, though. Um, it's it is there for you, and how to help bring that out. Um, anyway, to, you know, track him down. You can you can find him uh, online. You could find him through the Zungar website, I'm sure, in some way too, because he is a rep for us in Colorado. And Asad, okay. I can send you his his email address. Sure. Thank you so oh, much. There you, go. there you go. Yeah. Mm. Great. A any last questions before we end? Well, that also that also counts you, Natalie. I mean, you know, you're you're here as well. You may have a last question. <laughs> I, I don't know that I have any, but you know, <laughs> I always have questions. But I do well, appreciate for you for you know being here and presenting and. Um, I mean, I think that the 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 one kind of discernment that's coming out from this conversation, and maybe I'll just emphasize it a little bit and then see if you have any mm. final thoughts about it, is mm -hmm. that there's a difference between kind of a uh, what the what the unconscious brain can can shift to let's just use the stress response, right? That it can recognize mm -hmm. that it's in that habit of that fight flight energy and right. perceive the present moment is safe and then shift. And, and therefore we can experience more calm, better able to just be in the present moment, focused, et cetera. But then there's this right. other piece, which is our minds. And mm -hmm. where are we trying to get to? 
right? If we're mm -hmm. talking about meditation, right? One of the things that's talked about in, in Buddhism is that you will go as far on your path as you set the intention. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can talk about neurooptimals creating these good, good conditions, right? Where we can actually mm -hmm. work with our selves better because we're not right. constantly in that do these sort of crazy or states that don't right. allow us to actually direct our attention or our mind whether it's towards compassion or you know loving kindness or equanimity or concentration states you know whatever but that and if you have anything to say about this you know that really there is also the power of our thought right which is our intention mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and what what is our reason for meditating and maybe this is uh reluka you know part of what you can explore with your um your clients who want to use neurooptimal for meditation is to talk about well where are you trying to get to right what mm -hmm. is what is success or what is the, the fruition of meditation practice? What do you want your mind to be like? What do you want your sensory experience to be like? Where are you going? And so Val, if you have anything to say about, you know, sort of like intention or what your intention has been in creating neurooptimal or working with people. My intention, it is very interesting because it, it can be said fairly simply, but, but it's it kind of encompasses the whole thing uh, for me, and it's to transform suffering. And to me, that puts me right at the core of the the fourfold truths. You know, and how do you want to translate that? You know, the and and I've always joked that you know I think that they're actually taught a little bit out of order. I think the most important one is liberation is possible. It's like, you know, hey, hit the high point, right? Cut to the chase. Uh, you know, like, if liberation weren't possible, well, then what's the point? You know, and what makes liberation possible? Well, because we know the source of suffering. It's attachment. And it's part of the reason why I, I have a really strong disagreement with the use of the, of the word attachment in certain kinds of approaches to human psychology. It's not about attachment, it's about connection. The positive way to talk about it is connection. So you have profound connection, you have you know, stable connection, you have uncertain connection, you have ambivalent connection, whatever you, you know. You can permute that in a lot of different ways, um, but you know you release you release the attachments, you release the illusions, you release the ignorance, and you step off that cycle of chasing after the dragon of trying to find the state that fulfills because it no longer is painful or no longer or is more pleasurable or. You know that's that's still in the that's still on the the hamster wheel of attachment and desire. You know now does that mean that you don't have desires? I don't know how you're going to do a desireectomy. You know it's like this is we're human. Okay, that's the way it is. It's more that it, it, is it enjoyable? Is it is it fulfilling? Is the other thing? You know. I, I think we put too much emphasis on the word success, although it's better than a lot of others. It's about fulfillment. You know, what's really fulfilling? Is it, is it fulfilling to have, you know, millions of dollars yourself and to live in a world where people have a hard time getting through the day because they have no access to food? You know, is there is there something you can do to change that because you have the wealth and because you have that abundance, right? Maybe it's to, to help them understand how to create that abundance or access it. It's not just giving money. I'm not suggesting that, you know. So ah, 
yeah, we can get into some pretty deep stuff here. <laughs> and, well, I think, I mean, I think it's meaningful to acknowledge that your intention in your work has been to alleviate suffering. And, yeah. um, you know, that that goal, so to speak, helps us refine, right? As you've said, yeah. like it's really about learning, right? And then, and then that data helps us to refine as we go because we know what the goal is, right? And the goal yes. for you is to alleviate suffering. So how is my how is my neurofeedback device doing that, right? What Correct. tweaks yeah. could happen to to create more alleviation of people's pain um, along the path? And so I certainly have benefited from your intention. Um, and so <laughs> very much appreciate uh, you and, and for taking the time to talk with us and um, share your wisdom. Definitely. Well, thank you. I, I, I love it. This is this now my, my intention now is to spread the word. What can I say? <laughs> That's great. That's great <laughs> to share idea. the word, I should say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and thank you, okay. everyone, who's joined us. Your questions and your participation means a lot. So I hope everybody has a good rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. And um, we'll see you next time. I'm sure there'll be another conversation. Yes. Yes, I'm sure there will. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care, everyone.